Welcome, everybody. For those of you I have not had the pleasure of meeting, I'm Bruce Garfield, and I'm the executive director of the Columbus Music Commission, your Columbus Music Commission. Welcome to the final Music Monday of 2020. We figured that we'd get a really special guest for this evening. Before I start the proceedings, I want to take a second to thank the AEP Foundation, who make a lot of wonderful things happen in this city, the City of Columbus, the Greater Columbus Arts Council, and Scott Steinecker and Promo West Productions, the fifth largest concert promoter in America now, for making this series possible. The guest of honor this evening has really earned the title of Renaissance Man, and I don't use that that much. He is the writer of globally well-known songs, the producer of millions selling albums by cutting edge artists. He co-founded one of the most iconic record labels in the history of the music business, Sire Records, and went on to found the world's largest digital distributor. And to moderate this evening, a man that needs no introduction, but every time someone says that, they need to introduce them anyway. He is the, the man that's done more for music in Columbus, for local bands and artists. He's the owner of what's now CD 92.9. A few weeks back, it was CD 102.5. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Randy Malloy. <laughs> Well, thank you, Bruce. That is uh, uh, very nice of you to give me all sorts of uh, compliments. And uh, yes, uh, please introduce me, introduce me more and more and more. <laughs> well, actually, it's a, it's a really great honor to be uh, speaking with the, the real person who everyone came to see and hear tonight, and that is uh, Richard Garrer. And uh, um, a, a East Coast hard-shelled New Yorker, indeed, and... Uh, Someone that, uh, you know, I've gotten to speak with just a few minutes earlier before everyone got to be here. But uh, yes, Bruce uh, did not actually do Richard justice with the uh, resume that I went and found and read about. Um, started in the 60s writing music and uh, was a songwriter. Wrote the song, My Boyfriend's Back for the Angels. Um, started his own band. Now this one we have to come back to and wrote the state song that Ohio uses, Hang On Sloopy, wrote a song that David Bowie covered, Sorrow. You wrote I Want Candy, which was covered many, many times by lots of other bands. Um, your band, now, that's where we're gonna, you're gonna have to expand on that one, The Strange Love. That, that, the Strange Loves, you were an Australian band and none of you were Australian, which I love this story. Because I was like, hey, you know, when you got to go for it. At 26, you helped found Sire Records. And I was like, okay, well, that's pretty impressive. But at 57, he also then founded The Orchard. So it's like, okay, so not a whole lot of moss grows underneath your feet, apparently. You're, you're just keep going. So, you know, you, you've been credited with being one of the founders of New Wave. So what? You worked with Blondie, Madonna, the Ramones, the Talking Heads, the Go-Go's, the Bongo's, and more. And you helped produce, write, all of that. And you're still doing stuff. So that's a lot to unbox here. So let's sort of go back to, you know, let's start this. You're, you're in your 20s, you're writing music, go. <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> I started earlier than my 20s. I first got involved when I was about 16. And then um, I guess it was in my late teens, early 20s, when I started hanging around the area that we called the Brill Building. It, okay. There actually is a building in Manhattan called the Brill Building. And um, it, it was a place that and its uh, fellow Brillish building, 1650 Broadway, where as a kid, you could walk around from door to door, knock on doors, 
and say, I got a song, you know, and someone would listen to it. Sometimes they give you a small advance, $25 and take an option to see if they could get an artist to record it, you know, uh, within a six month period. And, you know, that's where I learned about um, the business. I saw all these really adventurous people, um, you know, that were out there um, basically following artists because most artists didn't write their songs. Recording artists did not write their own songs in those days. For most of them, they needed uh, songs that were written in their style. So we started working with that in mind. And we wrote songs for, I mean, if anybody remembers these people, but they were like top number one artists in their day. Um, uh, Bobby V, Freddie Cannon, Chubby Checker. I mean, we would just knock out Jerry Butler, the great Jerry Butler. We just write songs for these people. And eventually we started because we made demos and we went in recording studios we learned how to produce records and um, and to use that ability to produce records ourselves. So we went from, I'm saying we, um, two partners and myself, we were known as FGG, Feldman, Goldstein, Gadara. And um, we, um, we produced a lot of records. We wrote a lot of songs and we'll get to where you wanted to get to. So in, in like in the um, mid sixties, the business changed. People were not looking to the Brill Building anymore for songwriters writing songs for them because all the British bands started coming over. And they had originally taken our songs, but then they learned how to do it and they started writing for themselves. Lennon McCartney, uh, 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 Keith Richards, Mick, you know, and um, and they um, this is what people were interested in. So our little business as songwriters uh, produces was drying up because we were still doing girl groups. You know, after the Angels, we did a number of other ones, Patty Lace and the Petticoats, and people would hire us to do girl groups. Um, so um, we had a track to a standard. It was called, I love this one. That's all I want from you. I think it was Joe Stafford. Uh, a little love that slowly grows and grows. Not one that comes and goes. That's all I want from you. Well, we did it like a ska. A little love, love that slowly grows and goes, love. Not one that comes and goes, love. And in the middle, one of my partners goes, a little love that slowly grows and grows, not one that comes and goes, that's all I want from you. What a fake British accent. It was terrible. But <laughs> so we had licensed the record to a small label called Swan. Um, and Swan, remember, was the label that had She Loves You. They licensed. Originally, Capitol Records here did not want to release the Beatles. They saw nothing to them. But they started selling, and the export divisions would license those records to different places. Uh, Please Please Me was on VJ, and She Loves You was on Swan. Well, there was a connection there because Dick Clark apparently had a uh, a distant relationship. He, he would play everything that was on Swan Records on his American bandstand. But coming from radio, you know how that works. Um, um, so anyway, nothing's happening with the record, but we get a call from a disc jockey in Virginia Beach, Virginia. And he says, if you guys could come down here, I can make this record number one. You'll play at the big amphitheater on a big show I'm putting on. But no one wants to see three guys from, um, uh, from New York. You gotta be from somewhere else you know, because of that middle section. So we figured we couldn't pass for British, but nobody in America, America's really pretty backwards in a lot of ways, maybe still is, when it comes to international. Uh, so nobody really knew what an Australian was. So we became Australian. 
and we got um, zebra skin vests made of of zebra skin, and uh, we spoke with a fake accent. And um, but we go driving down to Virginia Beach to play the show. We pull into the radio station. He says, "What are you doing here? You can't be here. You know, get out to the airport right now." So go to the airport. He takes us to the airport. We get on. I think it was a Piper Cub that taxis down the runway and get to the entrance of the airport. There's like a thousand kids saying, <laughs> Virginia Beach welcomes Australia's strange loves. And they were throwing teddy bears and jelly beans. And we went out and did the show. And um, we had these African drums, which we said were Aboriginal drums. Um, um, I think we, we did a television interview and, um, and the uh, interviewer said, um, well, the three of you don't look like brothers. We called ourselves Miles, Niles, and Giles Strange. I was Niles. <laughs> and um, the three of you don't look like brothers. And I remember saying with my Australian accent, well, me mom spent a lot of time in the bush. Well... <laughs> meaning we, we could have been seated by any number of individuals that uh -huh. uh, my mother didn't tell us about. But, um, but there it was, stoned on stage, banging on these drums, and uh, we would do two or three songs. And um, then the Strangelows were born. And on one of the tours, we actually went on tour. I'll get to the story of, uh, of the song, but on one of the tours, we were coming through Tulsa, driving through. Uh, we did a show at Tulsa, and Dave Clark Five taped the show on a actual tape recorder, <laughs> and we, we used to do a song that we learned called "Hang On." It was called "My Girl Sloopy." We changed it to "Hang On Sloopy," and they said when we got off the stage, "That song's great. We're going to make that our next single." Well, we were really pissed off because I Want Candy by that time became a hit and we were doing an album and we hadn't finished it back in New York, but we had a track to hang on Sloopy. Next show, we're driving around and from Tulsa, we go through a storm, a hurricane, and we get to, I'm pretty sure it was Columbus, but it, it might have been Dayton, but... <laughs> It was somewhere in Ohio. <laughs> it was in Ohio. And we, ba I banged on these drums. The, the show, the Strange Love show began with me coming out. I had two spears because we were Africans, you know, um, and uh, Australians were like Africans. And I had these spears and I come running out and I go, ah! and I bury the spears on the stage, pick up. The, um, the the mallets and go boom, 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 boom. Okay. Well, um, we had to do that somewhere in Ohio. I think it was Columbus. And, um, and we needed backup bands. So we would rehearse in the afternoon and say, you know these songs, Time Is On My Side, uh, a Chuck Berry song, Bo Diddley, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah, 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 the kids know it. The band. So the backup band for that show um, was a band called Rick and the Raiders. And as I'm singing away, I hear the audience yelling, we want Rick, we want Rick. So I thought, how did they know my name? I'm Niles, they don't know Rick. I turn around, there's this little kid with a guitar blowing away, a, a smaller kid banging on the drums, he has to stand up, right? Well, we get off stage, we say, oh, you kids want to make a record? You got to talk to our parents. We go to their parents' house. They then follow us all the way back to New York. The tour is over. We had to change their name because Paul Revere and the Raiders were already a big star. And I said, what else do you guys call yourself? Well, how about the McCoys? And that's the start of Hang Lost Loopy. We took them into the studio. We had the track, they sang on it at our direction as producers, and Rick played that great guitar solo. 
and uh, he became Rick, not Zeringa, Derringer. So there was, and it was as simple as that. And uh, there's a story about how we got it up to Bird Burns. We put it out on the same label as The Strange Loves. And um, I think we went out on tour with them again. And by the time we got to the Midwest again, to um, Minnesota, nobody wanted to see The Strange Loves. They wanted to see The McCoys. Uh, because Hang On Sloopy uh, went to number one. And then, of course, it became um, the marching band at Ohio State University and became the state song. And it was written by a New York guy from the Bronx and another one, where the hell was he from? Wes Farrell. They're both gone now. Burt Burns and Wes Farrell wrote Hang On Sloopy. Yeah. Yeah. Well <laughs> Someone in the comment pretty much said it exactly. Fake it till you make it. That That is it right there. Well, it wasn't that much of a fake because years later, I went to Australia uh, to produce a band. They were called Mental as Anything. Now, that first of all, when I landed in Sydney, I looked around and said, feels like I'm home. <laughs> just like home. So I must have some Australian blood. But that Mental as Anything record, um, that Mental as Anything record, there was a song called Live It Up. And it came out of the, uh, what's his name? Oh, the Australian movie about... Uh, Crocodile Dundee? Yeah, Crocodile Dundee. It was used in a party scene and became number one everywhere but the United States, all across Europe, you know? And um, um, so um, I guess I really was Australian, you know? I mean, I, I, I don't have any, um, any reservations about being Australian. It's not a Millie Vanilli's thing. You know, we actually <laughs> sang and played and stuff. Right. You actually wrote it. You actually wrote it. Yes, well, yes. I mean, but we so didn't write yeah. What? So, so back in the days of the Brill, you, you basically, you know, you, you you use your creative talents and you shield, you know, I'm a writer and you just sort of went and walked around with ideas for songs. Absolutely. Um, and, and we eventually got signed um, with uh, a publishing company um, because they had a good plugger. Wes Farrell was a great plugger and he would take our songs. He, you'd know an artist was coming up. For who, artists that had hit records would go to publishers in those days and look for songs that were suitable to follow up the things they had. We, um, we wrote um, the follow-up to a great song, Palisades Park. Freddie Cannon, Palisades Park was number one. We wrote both sides of the follow-up. And um, uh, they got, it got into the 50s or 60s. But that, um, Jerry Butler came in. We wrote a song for Jerry Butler. We wrote a song for Dion. Of all the legendary artists from that period, um, uh, late 50s, 60s, Dion, Dion DiMucci, he still puts out music. He's, uh, his voice is as great as it ever was. He's now into the blues and he's got a great, I, I did a few blues albums with him recently but he's got a great one out now on a, on a small label. And if anybody's interested in the blues, um, that kind of music, he's a great singer. And, and I would, I would recommend that to anybody. But um, so you meet these people, you wrote, um, um, you write songs just off the top of your head. And it's, uh, it, it was a great, uh, it was a great time. And you're young enough to appreciate it at, in those moments because you're really not making much money unless you get really successful. But when you're really young, you don't need money. <laughs> you know, as long as you're, right, eating right. A hot dog, you're eating a hot dog and something, it's great. You know, um, today we set expectations for ourselves, you know, about what makes someone successful. And uh, back then at, at that level, just doing it was, was amazing. The fact that you could, be part of that. 
I mean, so now I, I, I'm just, I don't want to harp on the grill days because I do want to definitely get to the side of records. Now, but did you write a cer certain genre or is it just you sort of wrote and pitched it to whoever? I mean, if you, if you no, came you up with a right. I mean, song we, or? We were fairly good uh, songwriters, you know, uh, we played, I played piano. Um, uh, one of us was a exceptionally good lyricist and we'd come in and sit down at around the piano in a little little room the three of us and anybody got any ideas today anything happen well bob feldman comes in one day and says well i was getting i was at a at a soda fountain i was getting an egg cream which is chocolate with milk and seltzer and it fizzes up it's a great drink. It's called an egg cream. They used to put eggs in it, but they don't do it anymore. And they probably don't make egg creams anymore. But he was at, at the soda fountain and there was some girl yelling, you shouldn't be saying those things about me. When my boyfriend gets back, we're going to fuck you up or something like that. But she probably didn't say that. You know, in those days, nobody would use a word like that. You'd go to prison. Nowadays, for sure. Well, yeah, basically. In 1963, they'd be locking up people for pretty much what you see on um, on videos today <laughs> you know um, um, but he comes in so I said really oh, that's a good idea what could we call this oh, she's saying my boyfriend's back yeah my boyfriend's back let's write that story and then from our perspective with the concept of a beat uh, we would uh, write the lyric and that's literally where my boyfriend's back came from. And we did, we wrote that like in a day, we would write four or five songs a day and throw some away. And it'd be best when someone would come in and say, I need a song, I want something like this. Okay, how about this? And, um, and then you just um, work at doing it. Then you go down to a studio and the publisher would pay for making of a demo. And you might hire three or four musicians. I'd play the piano. There'd be a guitar, a bass, and a drum. If we needed a sax solo, I'd hire a saxophonist. And in uh, uh, doing it mono, you would lay it all out, rehearse it, make the recording, which would be the demo of the song. And pe we saw that people were copying our arrangements. So that's what made us want to be producers. Okay, so you, you, you've basically now been writing, you've been producing, you've gotten to sort of see the inside of the industry, and now at 26 years old, you took it upon yourself to say, hey, we're not, we want to distribute. We want to be, we want to be in control. We want to create a record company. And you well, founded Zion Records. Yeah, uh, what happened, what happened with that was um, I, I had met, um, I had met Seymour, Seymour Stein, um, and we became friends. And um, the FGG relationship, uh, Jerry, who Bruce knows, uh, he worked with Jerry, wanted to move to California. I wasn't going anywhere. I'm a New York person. And, um, and Bob Feldman was, you know, we were all going along together. And I guess it's sort of, the, the writing and the touring and the producing, it sort of um, wore out after a while. And um, so I went into business with Seymour and we started a, a production company. It was first called Sire Productions. And we got a deal to produce some records for, um, I think it was Epic Date Records. It's a, it's a Columbia Sony label. And um, so we had a production deal there it lasted for a little bit. And then we got involved with someone who was a one-stop distributor who had contacts at London Records. London Records was a the American British arm of the British company Decca Records, which was a major company at that time. Uh, De Decca Records, of course, had the Rolling Stones. Uh, so did Lund therefore London did. They had the Moody Blues as well. Um, they had turned down the Beatles when they had an opportunity, but they did okay anyway, you know. Um, um, 
There seems to be a lot of that. There seems to be a couple of these, we, we didn't get the Beatles. They turned them down. They didn't want them. They sold off some rights. Well, 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 you have to remember, uh, for us as Americans, we think we know everything. <laughs> there is a world out there, okay? And the people who are running the companies here, when you get involved with big companies in general, this is a lesson for anybody who's listening, it's, you think of this as this gigantic global monolith. Well, it isn't really. What it is, it's a company that has global vested interests, but basically each, com each country has their own interests. So therefore, when something comes out in the UK, if it doesn't really sell tons, the American entity would rather concentrate on what it's what the content that it's making, you know, and it would be the same in France, it would be the same in England. You know, you do something here, just because it's on an international label doesn't mean the English company or the French or German company divisions are gonna focus on it. So because everybody has their own interest and that's understandable. Which brings us to why how Sire developed. So we we started. I started producing some records. Sire originally was going to be more like uh, modeled after Electra or Vanguard. Electra started as a folky label, you know, because you can make um, you can make content relatively cheaply. So you know we. We put out a lot of folk records. Then Seymour and I started traveling to Europe. And what we did was we knew about the Beatles being turned down. We knew about all this stuff. <clears throat> so we went to the export divisions of these major record companies, thinking that they might have a ton of content and they have no way to get it released in the United States. So why don't we become that? And um, we did. We, um, we started picking up um, albums um, that were made in the UK that the American counterpart company was not interested in releasing. So we got these records for nothing. All we had to do was manufacture them, put them out to a legitimate place, and we, we did have it. Uh, we, we, had a, we had several groups, Barclay, James Harvest, a group called Climax Blues Band. I don't know if you've come across Climax Chicago Blues Band. Uh, they, they've had a number of small hits, uh, Renaissance, um, and, and a, lot of other, a lot of other smaller, lesser known things. And we were able to build a bit of a following because at that time, the attention was changing from AM to FM radio. All these albums were in stereo. Yep, that's what FM was. FM was in stereo. AM was in mono. So they would, we'd send these records to radio stations and they, they might play one entire side of a record. So we had minor hits. And on one of our trips to Europe, we met, we were in Holland and we met um, a man who said he had an album by a Dutch instrumental group. Well, you think, oh, nobody, nobody was interested in that. We were. We took this instrumental group, put it out, nothing happened. But they, but, but we needed, we thought, well, they can make a bit of a better record. And at that time, we, we had another partner uh, because Sire invested in another label. The label was called Blue Horizon. The thing about Blue Horizon was it was run by two brothers, Michael and Richard Vernon. Michael was the great producer. He had produced 10 years after John Mayle Band, you know, all for DECA. Um, but they started this label on the side called Blue Horizon where they would bring back the blues. 
and uh, they would find these old blues singers, and they they make small recordings of them without big expectations. But then they realized there are British kids who really liked it. And they signed this band called Fleetwood Mac. Well, not the Fleetwood Mac that we know here, but Peter Green's Fleetwood Mac. <clears throat> he was an amazing guitar player, but Mick Fleetwood was a drummer and uh, John McVie uh, was in it. So he, they had tons of hits and all of a sudden Sire, Seymour, Richard are associated with hits in the UK. They had a great instrumental called Albatross and uh, the original version of Black Magic Woman. Um, and um, oh, so Michael, we became friendly with, we said, we got this instrumental group. Why don't you produce them? So they go to England, our Dutch group, and um, they record an album with him that we then put out on a different label because London dropped us by then. We found a new deal somewhere else. It was famous music, Paramount. And um, this is all Sire. It's very beginnings that people don't know about. And um, um, the record comes out and on there was one single that shot up to number one in England. And we put it out here and I think it got close to number one or the album did. It was called Hocus Pocus. <laughs> and the group was named Focus. So anybody that wants to look that up, if you want to hear great, great guitar playing, um, uh, late 60s, mid, early 70s, really great guitar playing. And in the middle, Tyson Lee the flute player goes, he odi 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 he odi odi he yodels. And then the guitar goes, ba -da -da -da, ba -da -da -da. <laughs> it's like a metal guitar against it. Oh, they blow up like mad and Sire's off and running. And that's the early days of Sire, the beginnings. And um, then we keep growing, keep putting out artists and move on to another label, distributing us, another label. And eventually um, um, there's a number of different changes, but eventually along comes punk music. And uh, our friend Craig Leon, who was working for the company, somebody that I found um, and brought into the company, um, said, you guys ever hear of this band? I said, no, but he plays it for us. And it was the Ramones. And uh, Craig, if you see, produced the first Ramones album. And, um, and, the, and the Ramones led to all the other stuff, you know, because once you're in that, uh, frame of music. Now, again, the labels were not interested in it. It made like, it made like the major labels, no way. It was lousy, <laughs> you know, amateur music. Right. But, yeah. But, but for kids, it all of a sudden changed things. Talking Heads were a little bit different. They were a bit more finesse, but their early records weren't as finesse. Then they got some of the other players, you know, and they made this amazingly cool music. And, um, and everything grew out of that moment. And right around that time, Seymour and I weren't getting along. So I left and um, he carried on and built Sire into a really amazing company. And he signed like, uh, you know, unbelievable artists. Um, you know, including Madonna, um, um, Depeche Mode, The Pretenders, you know, really pretty amazing. I started hanging around CBGBs as well. I started a company called Instant Records and I recorded, uh, I signed um, three things out of the CBGBs um, um, element. Um, Robert Gordon, who I put together with the legendary Link Ray. If anybody's a guitar player you, and you don't know about Link Ray, you should find out. He's the original man who recorded Rumble. That was his original recording. But you should definitely look into Link. And the Robert Gordon records are great. Um, 
Richard Hell and the Voidoids, Blank Generation. I, I made that record. And one night, Hilly introduces me to some blonde-haired person. <laughs> and they wanted to um, talk to me. I went to rehearsal with them. I just absolutely love them, uh, Blondie. And um, I produced the first two Blondie albums. Um, they had Heart of Glass, but they called it the disco song, and they refused to record it with me. But Mike Chapman, fortunately, uh, retitled it and, um, and talked them into it. And um, then their history really boomed. I had one huge hit outside of the United States, a remake of a song called Denis. It was called Denise Denis. Denise, it was called, she called it Denis, um, and sang it about a boy and sang a little bit French in the middle. And it, 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 it was like number one across Europe. But um, so Europe, Australia, all that has, plays a vital part in my story. Yeah, it, I, I'm just kind of trying to absorb what that scene was like in that day. Um, you know, I, I, I was looking up to, I, I was oh, looking okay. up. What? I was going to say, I mean, it, it just, try to imagine that, that whole scene that was going on during that time. And, you know, you were such an integral part of creating a lot of the music that, you know, was what my generation, what I listened to and I grew up on listening to, you know, the Ramones, Blondie, the Talking Heads. I mean, those were the influential artists that created, you know, the radio station that's still, you know, we're still playing those artists. You know, I have a gold record plaque from the Ramones. I remember when I went and had lunch with them here in Columbus back in the what early did you 90s. Eat? What did you eat? Um, what did you eat? Fish. Fish. Fish? Well, fish. That's what Joey wanted. He wanted fish. Red snapper, Brussels sprouts, and oolong tea. I'll never forget it. Is, um, there's none of that stuff around Columbus. You know? Um, fish? He wanted fish. Okay. Um, <laughs> good for him. Um, I, uh, the scene was amazing. There were two places, Max, Max's Kansas City and CBGB's. Uh, all the bands played in both places, but they were quite different. The environment mm -hmm. at CBGB's was amazing. It was funky, dirty. They had a great sound system. Their bathrooms were infamous for the filth and, uh, and the writings on the walls. Um, but the energy, you could go almost any night and see, um, and see something that would be fresh, interesting. And um, remember, we were coming out of the disco era where everything was slick and polished. And also the, um, uh, I won't even call it psychedelic, you know, um, just different sort of musicianship where the level was and such. These were people that were looking back to the 60s, to songs of that, of that period. Uh, we're looking at the Velvet Underground. We're looking at Bowie, you know, and, and, and fresh, fresh, like, I wouldn't even call them amateur ideas. They weren't. They were, they were on the, um, they were on the cusp of something. Um, they were not polished. There was a group television that came out of there first. So that was the first one that was recognized by a major label. But um, I, I, I licensed the stuff I produced to a small label called Private Stock. And um, um, that's where we released the first Blondie records and also the first Robert Gordon and Link Ray records. Um, and um, I went back and brought um, Richard Hell and the Voidoids to Sire. So because they, they were probably the only label that would really get that, you know, having had the Ramones and early Talking Heads, um, Richard felt um, like a natural place there. Um, there's a record that, um, stands the test of time and you can go around the world and people collect that uh, blank generation. But in its moment, um, did absolutely nothing. 
hardly anybody really paid attention to it. You know, so it's uh, it it's interesting. It was a vibrant scene, and there was always something interesting, exciting happening there. And, and then from there, you you went on to continue producing music, and then 1990, you founded the Orchard. I mean, which is, I mean, an entirely different sort of outtake for what you were yeah. doing. Uh, it became this digital platform, and, and before, I mean, you jumped the shark. You were ahead of your time and there again. Yeah, no, between um, all those punk eras and then in the early 80s, I produced the Go-Go's, you know, uh, All Lips Are Sealed, and um, we got the beat and then kept producing. And someone from Columbus wrote me, I don't know if he's on there, but I forgot to mention his name, but uh, I produced a band called the Royal Crescent Mob. Yes, the RC Mob, exactly. Yeah, the RC Mob. And we did it up in Woodstock in the studios. And I had forgotten all about it. Uh, and because I did a lot of these recordings and sometimes, um, go from one to the other but it was interesting that he wrote me and i wrote him back after bruce uh bruce connected us uh so if he's on hi um um and um and a lot of records like that and then went on to start another small record company called soul three records and we put out a number of, of records i met a guy who became my partner again a new partner scott cohen and we had a, um, we opened an office in the um, tenement section of Lower Manhattan, right on a street called Orchard Street. And um, uh, we had um, a storefront and a basement, and then like a, a small, tiny apartment upstairs, which we used as our executive office. And, um, and we were um, putting out records and we had a, a group of interns and we had a few computers. Now, 97, you're talking about, um, oh God, 14, then I don't know, 23, 20, there was no, there was no broadband, everything was slow. Netscape was what you'd go through. And, um, and we tell them, well, go online and see if anybody's talking about metal music. We got a metal record. So you tell them about our record, you know, type it in. And all you could do is type, type it in. So we start doing that. And then we discover that there are um, record stores. One was called CD Now, not CD Baby, CD Now. It was a record store. And the other was called Music Boulevard. These were people that were thinking ahead and they were selling online, but there was a place out in Sacramento that there was that was their entire back end. So they came up and said, we're a record store with 250,000 titles. Well, they didn't, they had the list of titles. And so they were a virtual front we didn't know that. We tried to get our records distributed through them. And somebody there, I asked him, why can't you take our records? And he told me, I mean, he sold three records. We went out, we came up with the idea like that, Scott and I, well, we don't see any independent music. We'll bring them all the independent music. <clears throat> went out there, talked to the distributor who was supplying these places. They listened to our proposal, but really wanted to talk to me about everything you're talking to me about now. So all that crap paid dividends. Right. And they said, okay, we'll agree. You can be the provider to us of all the independent music. So go out and get it. So we started taking ads, talking on panels, going to shows, um, going to South by Southwest, among other things, going to meet them, taking a, spending our money. We had little money spending a booth at meet them. And the one thing we did that was 
that really made it was that all the independent artists wanted to get into this system. And we put a clause in the contract, um, a very simple clause, that you also give us the authority to uh, permission to sell your music, uh, store it, and deliver your music digitally as well. After a while, the business on the internet of selling, which was basically mail order, we didn't know what we were doing with that. But what we anticipated came to fruition. Um, broadband happened. You were able to download. Forgetting streaming, that was like no one even thought of that yet. So you'd be able to download content. Right. So record companies wouldn't have to manufacture it. You wouldn't have to ship it. I am do uh, I don't know when you remember what a miracle downloading was. I mean, it was amazing. You can just press a button. Well, it took time in the beginning. Right. It wasn't that quick, but you could download um, uh, content. There was MP3.com, uh, which really didn't pay. Uh, then there was the original Napster, which didn't pay. And then comes along iTunes, you know, with billions of dollars in the bank, and they go to the record companies and say, well, we're going to sell your music downloaded for the same price that you sell it in stores. Essentially, 99 cents, $1.29 a single, 10 bucks an album. Um, and um, you had the, the world of digital music starting. And um, we were right there by the time iTunes came along. Um, we had started to take in investment. We had 150, 200,000 titles. Um, the Orchard now, of course, is um, is owned by Sony, and uh, right. Right. we're up around could be up 10 million titles. I mean, <laughs> in the full independent and representing the independent side of Sony as well. So the Orchard is um, it turned out to be. Um, uh, when I look back and think of the first song I wrote and then think of what The Orchard is and to think that I'm still doing this, it's uh, it's pretty incredible, you know? <laughs> I mean, it's, it's incredible to me, not because I think it's incredible achievement, but it's just, <laughs> what, a, <laughs> what a, like Jerry Garcia, what a strange trip. I mean, you know, I, yeah. and, and I never thought any of it that I, I'll, I'll tell you the only place I really got, I, I get tremendous satisfaction out of the orchard, but where I really get the satisfaction is not necessarily the success. It's the moments when you're creating something in a studio, the way we used to create, where you're there in the moment and you're able to change things and, and things happen that you have to recognize because they might only happen once, you know, and when you can capture those magic moments. And, and that's, that's what I still think about is whatever I continue to do or I do next, it's how do I capture that moment? And I know we can remix things today. I know we could change things, but you know what? <laughs> When you when you know that moment when it happens, you know the mistake, the you know that's that's where it becomes um, creative, it becomes art, and it becomes special. I, you know, it's I could sit and listen to you for hours because I'm sure that the stories you have are absolutely legendary, and I mean it's 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 incredible because right, I mean you saw opportunity where maybe others didn't. You created things that didn't exist yet. And you basically took ideas and just ran with them. I mean, this is, you know, you are what, you know, today someone calls an entrepreneur <laughs> in the respect yeah, that you know, startups, I mean, everything. You, you did all those things. I think the important thing to know if anyone is out there trying to build something is one, you have to get in the game. And then you have to follow 
things, one thing led to another. I didn't all of a sudden say, we're going to invent a digital distribution company. Um, it, it happened because the momentum from something that happened prior to that led to the next step, that led to the next step, that led to the next step. Um, so to me, it was almost a natural progression. Although becoming a distributor, I thought was, I mean, I thought that was the worst. Of all the things you could be, um, to me, I used to say when I'd speak that, that they were the scum of the earth. <laughs> as a producer, as a record company, you would pay, but you see, they had to get paid by the record store in order to pay you. So the process of payments kept revolving later and later and later. With us, with digital, we, we've we set up uh, technologies so everything is automatic. But <laughs> back in the day, you would have, you if you had a hit record, you could go out of business because you had to manufacture to then ship to a distributor right. who would then ship it to a store. But you had to pay the factory for manufacturing. Right. If you didn't have enough backlog money and you're waiting for the distributor to pay you, you could be out of business. Right, right. So in the process, we, we, we live in it. That, so there were exciting things about that world. But the world today where things happen in the moment. I mean, I don't know the last, I, I do go to a store occasionally and buy groceries, but I also type in what I want from, from Amazon or Whole Foods and it right. shows up at the door, you know? Yeah, yeah. And it's so- Natural progression. It's a natural progression. And as much as I'd love to see the feeling of the live recording and all, can't go back to it. I had the experience and it's a wonderful thing, but it's not going back, you know? No. I mean, not unless we have the dark ages again and we have to reinvent ourselves, you know? Right. Uh, and then it'll come the middle ages. And then by the time we get back up here again, we'll be in the same crap hole we are now, you know? <laughs> right, right. Well, <laughs> you know? right. It, it's oddly enough, I mean, you know, I, I told Bruce that I was gonna, it might get a little noisy, because natural progression is, you know, where we have bands and we played in front of audiences. Sure. Of COVID right now, you know, this is what's going on in my background. I've got a live stream show. As soon as I'm done doing this, we're going to have the, a local band, the Castros, do a live stream for a holiday special they're doing here tonight. That's so great. It's, but, and that's, that's, but that's virtual because otherwise there's nowhere to do it right now. We had to progress. Yeah, and if you think this early Zoom stuff is, this is just early stuff. It, no. It's gonna get more finesse and, and people are, you know, in, in a sense, it's a great thing. And in another sense, um, that contact when you're at a show and the interaction between the audience and, and the artist, and it, it's gonna, it's very hard for the Cascades or anybody to feel, um, you know, to, to deliver and feel because they're not getting the live feedback. So I, um, I sort of miss that. Well, I, I you know, I, I've got to say that I will definitely want to, to speak with you again when uh, Bruce allows that. But uh, I know that we want to get questions in here because I can't imagine that there is not, I'm watching sort of this stream of questions on my okay. web chat go by and, uh, I, I definitely want some people to get their questions in. So um, Bruce or Thane, I know that, that I think uh, Richard can see them. Um, so go ahead and uh, answer some of these questions because uh, what about? I, I can see that people are pretty questioning here. Okay. I don't see any questions. It's okay, I'll read some off to you. Go ahead. How about it, Thane? This one comes from Joseph Cross. Uh, thank you for spending time with us, Richard. What piece of wisdom would you share with a contemporary songwriter who loves the classics? Oh, well, 
if you love the classics, first of all, uh, when you say classics, I mean, um, I, I don't think that goes away. A great, a great song is the, um, is the uh, backbone of the whole business. I mean, look at the guy, <laughs> look at the guy who did that TikTok video of the Fleetwood Mac song, Dreams. I mean, just think about that. I'm willing to bet 90% of the generation that saw that uh, had no idea, well, maybe not 90, but practically that, uh, n no, had any idea that of that song, Dreams, um, or Fleetwood Mac, for that matter. And all of a sudden, it's rediscovered. So my advice would be just write songs that you feel um, are great and pay attention to the classics, but only use them as a, as a learning place of knowing what came before. Uh, to be successful with songs today, I think you have to write from the perspective of, of today. And, um, um, but I think having a knowledge and loving what you call, quote, the classics, whatever that might be uh, to you, um, is a good thing and is helpful but you, you write music for the moment that you're in. I like that, I like that answer. Uh, this next one comes from Paul Nini. He says, I personally feel that Spotify and other streaming services are severely underpaying artists and labels. How do you feel about this issue? And does The Orchard have any plans to try and change the situation? Thanks. Yeah, um, The Orchard, uh, like everyone else is, um, um, I won't say beholden, but the business that we operate comes from um, from the streaming services now. Uh, although we do put out physical and we still do downloads. Uh, Spotify, Apple Music, um, I, it's not that they're, you know what it is, our business was always geared uh, for the successful artist. Those are the people that made money in the music business. If you didn't have a hit and you weren't a, um, um, a valid touring artist, you weren't really going to um, make much money out of it. Um, I do think there's room for Spotify to pay more. I think particularly uh, attention should be paid uh, not just to the recording artist, but to um, songwriters and music publishers as well, songwriters um, that I think um, are not getting uh, the fairest share um, in, the, in the streaming world. But um, certainly artists, you know, I don't even know what to say about it. I mean, this is basically what Spotify is, is going to pay and um, get a hit record and you can make a lot of money from it. Uh, without the hit, it's um, it's difficult. Cool. Uh, this next question is anonymous. Uh, it's, what advice would you give to a local band? Oh, well, it's, um, again, a local band. It gets a little harder now, doesn't it? Because there's not venues to play. Um, you know, uh, well, there is venues, but you can't. You can't go and play. So uh, that's how you build your audience. A local band would build live. Uh, otherwise, I would say, I mean, it's relatively easy to, um, to record now and you can license your music to places like The Orchard or put it up online yourself. Um, so, but what I would say is uh, try to build a local following uh, because that following influences other um, other people, and then you can grow and build from there. Cool. Looking for the next question. Oh, okay. Marco Shea says the trend today is to create singles and release singles. Do you feel that recording business, being a business that runs in cycles, will move back to albums and songbooks, or is it stuck with the future of just single, single, singles? No, I think it's single, single, singles. Um, you know, 
um, when, when you get to be a monstrously successful artist, um, <clears throat> putting out a collection of eight to 12 or 15 songs becomes significant because it's not like somebody buys the album, but they get into all the songs. Uh, when you're an artist growing, I think uh, singles is the way until you have enough of a collection of a body of work so that you can build a fan base that is willing to pay attention to, um, uh, to more of, of what you're about. Um, or the thing about an album would be if you could have a consistent theme so that the collection of songs goes together to support that feeling and, and theme. But most people don't listen to, um, unless it's of a hit artist, don't listen to an entire album anymore. And um, I think, um, I think um, what happens is you might hear if one of your uh, artists that you love puts out a quote album, you'll listen to it, but you'll really only go back to the few songs that really strike you. So I think it's um, I think it's a single world, yes. Makes sense, I think you're probably right. Uh, so Davis Evanhoff asks, hearing that you gravitated, to gravitated towards music of all different styles and genres, when you found interest in an, into a new artist, what is the defining quality that intrigues you and garners your interest the most? Is there a defining quality? Uh, the song. I mean, I, I, I'm still come from the roots of songs from where I originally came from. So I think, I think a more traditional song. I, to, today's songs are written and constructed with beats, sounds, words come together. They, they sort of mesh together. Um, I like starting with nothing but the song and then adding to it. I, don't, I personally don't structure the pieces and that makes the song. So um, I, I think what, what strikes me and what I look for most is, is the song. Is it, does it have something to say? Is it catchy? Is the title catchy? Um, is there a good melody? And after you do that, you can put a beat to it. You change an arrangement, you structure it. So for me, it's, um, it's the song. And then, if I look at the artist, what sort of edge, what's the difference? Why would I like to get to know that artist? And, and um, so when I put all that together, those are the ones I like to work with. Okay, this next question comes from Zach Colsar and he asks, I know you don't know Columbus as well as the people who live here, but is there anything that you would say is integral in creating a music Cre creating a music that a city like Columbus would benefit from. In past conversations, we've talked about things like presence of record labels being a big reason why people move away from cities like Columbus. Uh, but what besides that? Yeah, uh, well, you have a good radio station. That's good. Yes, we do. Um, um, I, I, would, uh, I would say a recording studio, live venue, um, and you are right. Um, uh, I'm trying to think outside of Clovis, New Mexico, where Buddy Holly made all his records. I don't know. Uh, I mean, San Antonio is not a big city. They have uh, they have a facilities. Uh, Austin, Texas. Um, I'm thinking where record companies uh, are. But even New Orleans, you know, uh, is not even a not many. Well, there is uh, a Lil Wayne. But uh, there's not like, um, um, unless it's a big city um, to support um, a record company, uh, I don't know. But if Columbus put together something where there was a, in a modern sense, a record company or a production company that dealt with local talent, and develop local talent, and then came to me, and we put it out through the orchard, or I got involved with 
with it. Uh, Columbus has always been a place where uh, where rock music flourished. I mean, also we've got a huge university. I mean, definitely. I don't know what most university uh, kids getting an education uh, choose to listen to. Does it happen to be rap? Does it happen to be? Uh, I mean, did um, did WAP interest most uh, most uh, college students? I don't know. Or are you still interested in um, in jam bands? Are you still interested in cool music? Uh, you know, I don't know. But I would say it could be developed out of Columbus uh, with the right combination of people. Yes. Okay. Uh, Riley Baker asks, who is the most recent artist you've signed or that you're working with? Uh, what do you think they bring to the table or that attracted you to them? Well, I mean, I, I, I'm developing new artists myself. Um, so I'm putting out a record um, in um, uh, January, right after the inauguration. It's called Godspeed. The artist is a girl, 19 year old, named uh, uh, India Lake. Um, India has um, a great voice. She comes from a tradition where she's able to write really um, great, fresh songs. So that's what interests me. She has a voice. Um, she's able to translate that voice and songs into a really good recording. So uh, look out for her. India Lake, the song's called Godspeed. And also it's a 19 year old writing about what's going on in the world today with the fires, the um, racial discord, um, the nonsense with the election, the uh, COVID stand six feet apart. And what does that mean to a 19 year old? You know, and uh, um, the fact that she can express it, um, I find interesting. She can express it in song. So uh, you've really stated the importance of the song. Uh, what's, and Wolf Star asks, what's your current favorite song? Hmm. Let me think. I, I'm trying to think of which, I can't remember the name. I like Chris Stapleton's songs. Uh, I, you know, I mean, there's something very real, earthy, um, earthy about it. But that's they're more traditional songs than uh, um, I think. I think the great songs now come out of Nashville. You know, so um, I go back to more more tradition. I I would also say as an artist, I I think. Um, obviously Billie Eilish um, and um, the one who surprised me most that I didn't think I'd like her again is Taylor Swift you know I know it, 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 some people might think that sounds lame but it's not I mean she was the last album she put out was absolutely great and it was very real and it could have fit um, 25 30 years ago Cool, I think we have one last question. It's an anonymous one. Uh, have you heard of any Columbus artists? Like uh, modern or, or past? Uh, no, but any Columbus artist who's out there that wants to send me anything can just send it to richard at theorchard.com. Richard at T-H-E-O-R-C-H-A-R-D.com. And uh, I'll listen to it. And, give you some comments and send it back to you. Um, I did hear an artist from Ohio State, uh, Jack Harris. He's a um, young guy that writes writes music. I think he's from Cleveland. He writes songs. And uh, Bruce introduced me to him. And I think he's really, really good. Again, because the songs are good. And he has the you know, with the right direction, a chance to succeed. But that's about it. I don't know anything else about artists from, from Columbus, Ohio now, but I'd love to learn more about it. 
Dean, I thank you for uh, reading for me as uh, the band was actually sound checking in the background. And I was trying to uh, not, not, not open my mic up and be too noisy as they were uh, doing their sound check, but uh, read those questions. I was going to ask about Billie Eilish because uh, I was wondering what your thoughts were on Billie Eilish, and obviously. Uh, you kind of answered that, and the Taylor Swift question came up too, because uh, you definitely have a uh, uh, you know song versus tunes. I think as you, you're you're a, you're a purist. I think when it comes to songs, if I'm not mistaken, Richard. Yeah, I would say I would say that's right. And then finding finding the sound and the structure to turn a great song into a great recording. That's, that's the idea. Um, but I would start with the song where a lot of people start with fitting a song into a recording. Um, but then again, a lot of people are monstrously successful today doing it that way. So like I said, I could think of doing it my way, but whatever way works, you know, but you need a great song to make a great record or a great concept, something other than just the pure sound of it. Right, the foundation. The world song is the foundation. Right, yeah. right. Interesting. Well, I mean, I, I, I found it to be fascinating. And as I said, I uh, I could sit and just listen for a very, very long time. Um, your, your, your history in this industry is uh, beyond legendary and when uh, Bruce uh, said that, you know, this is who this is going to be the final one for the year. I was like, okay, I will be very happy to moderate and uh, be able to talk to uh, uh, Richard because uh, I, I am a huger fan than I was before. So thank you for spending Thanks, the time and allowing me to uh, ask a few questions and uh, spend a little time with you virtually and hopefully someday I'll get to uh, meet you in well, you person. Are, you, are from, you are from New York and New Jersey. Yeah, my, you shouldn't allow yourself. You shouldn't allow yourself to be stuck out there forever. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm okay with this. I'm, I'm, sure, okay with this Ohio, I'm, sure, I'm sure it's a great place, and you know, I remember passing through Columbus a number of times, but never really spending a lot of time there. Well, but, you'll be um, hearing, Richard. You'll be hearing more music from Columbus. You know, we have, particularly Randy Station, but other stations that all play local music. We have wonderful venues. We have people that love music. Great. Um, we have a, you know, maybe Scott Steinecker, who owns Promo West, which is one of the, now the fifth largest promoter in the United States, who's based here. And he has built artist career over the years by working them through his series of four venues. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're talking, you know, 21 pilots and lots of bands yeah now that now that we have you in the in the game with us oh yeah no i'll, I'll, I'll be breaking columbus artists with you in the orchard i'll play with you no problem uh it sounds <laughs> great you know columbus you know it's the heart of rock and roll it's uh nearly america it's nearly the center of america so richard thanks so much you know i i say that it was your writing partner they gave me my first part-time hourly wage job. Yeah. I think I remember first meeting you at that Brill building and had these visions of people. I think I heard a story of three of you guys sharing one slice of pizza that cost 15 cents and asking the person to please cut it in thirds. <laughs> but thank you very much for joining us. And Randy, thank you for moderating. And to our thank audience, you, Thank you, hey, hey, Randy, Randy, stay in touch. Just send me a contact. I will, absolutely. Well, you know. I mean, no, I'm, I'm going to plug that if anyone wants to see the Castros do a live stream, you know, it's on our YouTube page starting at about, um, let's see, 14 minutes. And I'll be doing the same thing, but I'll be showing these other uh, frames because we'll have the band up there doing <laughs> a live stream. So Amazing. I believe it's CD 92.9 FM slash dot com slash youtube there you go okay thanks to our, our audience you guys have been great you've given us a fabulous year we hope to be able to at least give you back what you give us so with that said have a wonderful holiday 
a happy, healthy new year. May next year bring us all good health and a return to at least some degree of normalcy. Take care. Peace out, everyone. <laughs> Thank you.